He's a dynamic speaker, a brilliant social commentator, and a very dear friend. Please welcome tonight's keynote speaker, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. <laughs> You ever hear the expression, a discomforting experience? A discomforting experience is having to speak after Moshe Brisky. <laughs> it's all downhill. I don't know what I'm going to say. What I've set out actually to do in the book, Rebbe, I spent five years studying the life of the Rebbe, and it was quite a remarkable experience. My wife, Devorah, would comment that when I would come home from 770, which is the headquarters of Chabad, sent, you know, headquartered in Brooklyn, she said I was always in a good mood because the atmosphere there tended to be very optimistic. I'm going to speak later why it is because of the Rebbe's commitment, one of the reasons being the Rebbe's commitment to the use of very positive language. But what I wanted to do really was not write a biography, not focusing on the entirety of the Rebbe's life. I was really interested most in the last 40 years of his life, from the time he became the leader in 1951 of a small movement headquartered in Brooklyn and helped grow it into the most dynamic religious movement in modern Jewish history. And he set for himself a goal that no other Jewish leader with whom I am familiar had ever set for himself or herself, and that was to reach every Jewish community and every Jew in the world. It is perhaps no coincidence that all of this occurred in the aftermath of the Holocaust, for as Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of England and really one of the great Jewish scholars in modern Jewish life, put it, if the Nazis hunted down every Jew in hate, the Rebbe wanted to hunt down every Jew in love. And he succeeded. Chabad today is located, has, has Chabad houses in 48 of the 50 American states. I'll just do, anybody want to try Trivial Pursuit? Anybody want to guess where they're not? South Dakota. South Dakota. And here's my other, no, North Dakota now has one. And here's a hint. What has four eyes but can't see? Mississippi. Okay. In 80 countries, my friend, Rabbi Brisky's dear friend as well, Dennis Prager, was in Phnom Penh a few years ago, Cambodia, spent Shabbat at the Chabad house with 14 other Jews from 10 different countries. The largest Seder in the world in recent years has occurred in Kathmandu, Nepal. That's obvious. Everybody would guess the largest Seder in the world would occur in Kathmandu, Nepal, appealing to Israeli backpackers, who, if not for that Seder, might not go to any Seder at all. 1,100 were there last year. A decade after the Rebbe's death, Rabbi, Rabbi Eric Yaffe, the president of the URJ, the Union of Reform Judaism, said, it is hard for me to say it, but I will say this nonetheless. We in the reform movement must follow the example of Chabad. He understood something that went beyond that Chinese proverb. The expression, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, suggests that each step is important because it's part of that journey. The Rebbe, though, went a step further. He said that each step mattered even if it wasn't part of that journey, each step had value in and of itself. It's not widely known, but in segments of the Orthodox world, that tefillin campaign was criticized. Some very prominent rabbis said, it's absurd. Totally non-observant Jews are going to put on tefillin, and then they're going to go eat unkosher food. Women will light Shabbat candles and then violate the Shabbat. And so to them, it all had to fit into that journey. The Rebbe argued every act had value in and of itself. He wasn't deterred by that. That was the sense that he could convey to people that each act was holy, and that's what enabled him to also be non-judgmental. When Rabbi Meir Lau, who subsequently became very well known as being the chief rabbi of Israel, but when he was a young rabbi, 
he came to meet with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe asked him what sort of work he was doing in Israel, and he said, I'm involved in Kiruv Rechokim. I'm involved in bringing close to God people who are far away. And the Rebbe said to him, how do we know who's Karov and how do we know who's Rachok? How do we know who's near? How do we know who's far? They're all near in God's eyes. How many of you have ever heard the expression? It's a Yiddish expression, but it's sometimes used in English. It's hard to be a Jew. It's a common expression. A man comes to the Rebbe and is very unhappy. He said, I raised my children in the spirit of Judaism, and now they're becoming non-observant, and they're drifting far away. And then he shrugs his shoulders, and he says, ah, it's hard to be a Jew. So the Rebbe looks at him curiously and says, by the way, is that an expression you often used? He said, when appropriate, I use it. It is hard to be a Jew. He said, well, if that's the case, why do you expect your son to enjoy being Jewish? <laughs> he hears from you all the time. As a says, I say, yet. it's hard to be a Jew. Maybe you should say it's good. It is good. It's good to be a Jew. So in other words, he applied a whole new sort of optimistic approach. You know, he wanted us, we feed our mind with positive words. Another distinctive feature of the Rebbe was what I call how to disagree without being disagreeable. How did the Rebbe master that? He focused on what he had in common with other people rather than what distinguished him from other people. When a rabbi wrote him a letter critical of some positions the Rebbe had taken and emphasizing how different he felt from him and how separate he felt from him, the Rebbe wrote him back, but there are still 612 areas in which we agree. He took the metaphor, you know, used metaphorically the 613 laws of the Torah. He wanted to focus on commonalities. I want to speak also for a few minutes on another aspect of the Rebbe that's very critical. If you hear people on occasion criticizing Chabad, they felt that the Rebbe was in some ways too dominant a character, that his power over people was too strong, people became passive. Whenever I hear people say that, people became passive, the thought I immediately have is, well, you obviously haven't met any of the shluchim. You know, because the truth of the matter is the Rebbe wanted to empower people. One of the people who realized that was Jonathan Sachs. Sachs met the Rebbe when he was 20. He was studying philosophy at Cambridge, and the Rebbe kept pushing him, you know more about Judaism than almost anybody else among the students. You have a strong Jewish education. How can you just stand by passively and not try and spread teachings about Judaism? Sachs said that it was that conversation that motivated him to become a rabbi, but when he left, he said he had an insight about the Rebbe. He said, a good leader creates good followers. A great leader creates other leaders. The Rebbe understood that there had to be this outreach, this outpouring of love, and he did it. And exactly what Rabbi Brisky spoke about, I experienced in my own family. My father for 40 years was the accountant for the Rebbe and for the Friedeke Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, from the time Chabad had come to the United States. So I had very wonderful relationships, and my father certainly did. And then in 1986, I was living in Israel, and I got a call from my mother that my father had had a stroke, and I should come home immediately. I come back, my father is not conscious for a few days. Every day we got two phone calls from the Rebbe's office, usually from Rabbi Krinsky. The Rebbe wants to know how your father is. One day my father comes out of his coma, and he's a little disoriented, and we're very, very excited, though. And I continue to get calls twice a day. A few days later, I get a call from Rabbi Krinsky. The Rebbe has an accounting question for your father. <laughs> so I say to him, Rabbi Krinsky, you know how disoriented you are? You know how sick my father is? He said, of course. The Rebbe knows that, but he still had a question. I bring the question to my father, and he's able to answer it. And it struck me what had happened. The Rebbe was sitting there at his office in Brooklyn, dealing with all sorts of major, major macro issues confronting the Jewish people, issues with his people all over the world, but he was also thinking about my father, Shlomo Telushkin, lying in a hospital bed, feeling that his life had basically come to an end. My father was like a man running a mad dash who suddenly runs into a brick wall. Suddenly he can't work anymore, suddenly he can't give his uh, weekly Talmud shear, 
And so the Rebbe came up with a question, whether it came about because he had inspiration, ideas were put into his head from a higher source, or whether because he had an extraordinary amount of moral imagination, and he had both. So he came up with a question that my father could answer. And by doing so, gave my father again a sense of hope, a sense of purpose, this willingness to think in terms of love, that even though he preached the broad love of the Jewish people and a broad love of humanity, it always was rooted first in dealing with the individual. And this is what part of his power came from. So what I wanted to set out to do in the book is to really find these issues, what I call the special virtues of the Rebbe, the love of neighbor, the unconditional love of neighbor, and the focus on the individual his ability to create fearlessness and thereby create leaders, his sense of optimism and his careful choosing his words, his extraordinary work ethic. His father-in-law had said of him, at 4 a.m. in the morning, at four in the morning, Menachem Mendel is either getting up or going to sleep. He had that real sense of an ongoing, tremendous work ethic. His ability to express disagreement without being disagreeable by focusing on areas of commonality that he had with others. Because even if we can't work together on this issue, there are other issues in which we can work together. Another idea of the Rebbe, anything worth doing, what is the expression? Anything worth doing is worth doing, is worth doing well. The Rebbe's attitude was anything worth doing is worth doing now. The Rebbe touched a phenomenal amount of people. He had influence on people of great prominence, he had influence on, very, on simple people. He saw each person in the, is being in the creation of God's image. And when you really, really believe that, you understand the holiness of every person. And it's not therefore surprising that you then send out emissaries to the world. He set out a goal to reach every Jewish community and every Jew in the world. One of his early shluchim, Beryl Shem Tov, told me when the Rebbe first announced that we're going to go out into the world and reach every Jewish community, it was in 1952, and Shem Tov was at a, a yechidus, not a yechidus, he was at a farbrengen with the Rebbe, there were 30 people present. Anybody else would have thought this man must be demented. 30 people, they're going to change the world? And the answer is they did, because they had a vision and it was a good vision. So many of the people who have visions in this world, their vision is not to wake the world better. Their vision is to conquer and to take possession of others. The Rebbe's vision was to show people that there were people who loved them and that God loved them. And through that love, they could change the whole world. And they have done so, and they're continuing to do more. Thank you very much. Thank you.